Well, my flying was out of Mirac. Yeah. Uh, that that leads me to one thing. You were involved in that right from the start, right? Yes. Now, who was uh, who was the test pilot? Slick, Slick. Goodland. Goodland. Yeah. What was he like? Hmm. I'm a pretty average guy. A little bit cocky, but. Uh, well, he's a fighter pilot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, so what? <laughs> we all are. <laughs> uh, but it didn't it, let me see if I get this right. It it got to the point where at about point eight three or four control stability problems because of the blockage of the of the stabilizer, horizontal stabilizer. But then didn't he sort of say, well I'll take it Mach one if you'll pay me a hundred thousand dollars? Does that sound familiar? Oh slick? Yeah. Or Chuck. Slick. <laughs> okay, there were two airplanes, two X ones. Six two and six one. We had six two. NASA had Six one. Um, he took it up. I don't know how, long, but then he he wanted a lot of money. There you go. The ball was passed to us. Uh, oh, that's why. Yeah. We had already. Um, Boyd, Gerald Boyd, called me into his office one day. And he said, we're going to go break the speed of sound bomb. Um, were, were you the only B-29 pilot for it? I was chief of bomber section at Red Field. Okay. Fighter, bomber, cargo section. Right. And so it logically called me and said, I've already selected the crew, Bob. Chuck is primary on the X-1. Bob Hoover alternate if anything happens to Chuck. Um, you're the B-29 pilot, the launch and project officer. Jackie Ridley is your co-pilot, and Jackie's job is to figure out, figure out a whole program that has to be progressive and brief, period. That word, remember that, brief. Brief? Yeah. What the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's get it done. Um, go out to Edwards, I mean, go out to Muroc, and um, so uh, <clears throat> Jackie Ridley figured out uh, nine flights, with the ninth one to be the one we'd go through the sound barrier. So he, he started out at, um, I think it was 82, 0.82, 0.84, 0.86. Um, on the third flight, I have a picture of my hand going down launch. Um, well, in fact, it's in that thing the National University showed, where my that video mm -hmm. shows my hand. I went like that, and it wouldn't drop. I thought, oh shit! Um, Which flight was that? Third flight. And was it was it Hoover or Jaeger in it? No, no, Hoover never flew the X one. He never flew it. Oh. He was just the alternate of the chase. He, fly, he was flying chase and chase. The All the missions were flown chase by Bob Hoover. Flying a F-84. I think it was an 84. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, I would. Any, anyhow, uh, Jackie Ridley went back through the tube back there to see if he could somehow get the thing to release. I had visions of. And the thing releasing in Jackie straddling the top of the cockpit. <laughs> um, but he couldn't get it. So I had to, I said, Chuck, try to get rid of as much of the rocket fuel as you can because I'm going to have to land with this thing. <laughs> and all he said was, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, I said, if you want to come on up, uh, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll stay here for a little while. So he, he was dumping fuel. But we still had about half of that rocket fuel. And what concerned me was on takeoff, I could not lift the nose wheel more than about 12 inches without 
scraping the X1. Yeah. And so on landing, I figured what I have to do is land this thing almost three point, almost. Um, and not hide, because it might shake it loose. So I did. I landed almost three points. I had it slowed down to where it was just flying, and I touched down on three. Why didn't it release? Uh, the, uh, the release mechanism had jammed. Mm. Um, it wasn't very good anyway. They couldn't get it to release. On the ground, they finally did, but they supposedly fixed it, and I went fourth flight, fifth flight. Never had that repeat. Um, well, when but, was where was it when they discovered they had to fly it with trim? Somewhere along in that, they figured out to fly it with trim. Yeah, it was on the. I think it was on the eighth flight. Um, Jackie Ridley. That word brief came in. I had a decision to make. Of course, Chuck did not want to leave that airplane for Uber. Um, personal animosity <laughs> at the time. So, well, Hoover wouldn't have wanted him to fly. <laughs> it would have been the same both ways. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, my job's is brief. If I bring in Bob Hoover, I owe it to him to give him an extra flight, and we're already about to run the eighth flight. And uh, I, I, I'm going to violate the law <coughs> of brief. So I shut up. I didn't say. I could have moved Hoover. Mm -hmm. I, I could have moved Hoover, and I had every reason not to, not to let Chuck fly it. So uh, we moved uh, we moved Chuck in. I mean, uh, yeah, left Chuck in there. Uh, and then the ninth flight, he did it. So the trim condition on the eighth, uh, Jackie really pretty much uh, figured out what to do. Uh, he was a, actually he should should get more recognition than than he did. Because um, all I did was drop him. <laughs> well, I mean the person you know, the, 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 you know, it's like the quarterback. You know, everybody knows about the quarterback. You know, yeah. <clears throat> and Yeager just happened to be the guy. Yep. It's a matter of almost a coin flip at this yeah. point. You could have gone with Hoover and had one more flight. So tell me what happened. Did, did, how did we know that he went supersonic? Uh, I have the text that Chuck was talking. And uh, he was addressing himself to Ridley. He said, Ridley, something's wrong with this goddamn thing. Uh, the Mach meter won't go any further. <laughs> That's the word. I have a recording of it. Um, and so that was it. So I understood that he made a you know made a statement over the air, you know, about the instrumentation and then about then they heard a sonic boom on the ground. Well yeah, down on the ground. He said I, I dropped them too slow. Yeah. And it, what was the drop speed? How fast were you? What was your indicated? as fast as I could get that B-29 to go. Really? What, 225 or so? Yeah. Um, I forgot the exact speed. So, and, and you're sitting in the airplane, and then you watch this thing drop away. I can't see it. But when he fires it off, he goes in front of you, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. It? Yeah, he goes right in front, does a roll. Oh, really? Did a roll? No kidding. And then, and how far away do you suppose he was by the time he actually went Mach 1? Oh, it wasn't more than about two, three minutes or so, and he was way up ahead. Um, 
Does it? Does there white smoke that comes out of it? It's not white. It's condensation. The condensation. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, that's right. It's water and kerosene, isn't it? Or no? What is it? Kerosene and oxygen. Kerosene, water. Yeah. I am. No, that's that's okay. So, <clears throat> so he goes up, and then they hear a sonic boom on the ground. And now I want to change subjects. What's the guy's name? The YF-86 that they said broke the sound barrier a few days earlier. What was it, a Welsh or something like that? George Ross. <laughs> yeah, George Ross. Um, what is your opinion? He, he <clears throat> The F-86 was a good bird. I commanded the F-86 wing on Okinawa earlier in 1951. And uh, I've flown that thing to its limit, et cetera. The F-86 will not go supersonic, period. You can put it in a straight dive. Um, Without afterburner. Yeah. And, and the YF apparently didn't have an afterburner. So, um, no, I don't think so. There was quite an animosity between George Ross and Chuck. Really? Uh, not, not, if you were close to both, you knew it, but they were careful not to say things. But no, I, I don't think he did. Um, I remember the incident. And he told me that one time you told him that the reason you knew that, that Yeager was the only guy to break the sound barrier about that time was because Poncho Barnes told you <laughs> they only had one set of booms. <laughs> Is that right? Well, uh, Poncho did tell me that, but that was not the reason, no. <laughs> so, but, but, but tell me about Poncho Barnes. I've never talked to him. I really knew her. You must have known her a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I did not know her background of her early life. Uh, I, I knew when I got there, my wife had her scuttlebutt <laughs> as to what her place was. Well, were you staying up there at the time, or did you live in L.A. or something like that? No. When we, when we got the order to go back up there and finish the test and went on. Her happy bottom club was off to one side there. Um, the, the only way you got to meet Pancho was to be introduced to her. And the introduction was real simple. The person would take you to her front door, the happy bottom running club. And um, knock on the door, and then he would leave you there alone, and the door would open, and there would stand Pancho in a pair of patties, and if you flinched, you know, when she opened the door and you flinched, she'd say, "Get your ass off my man, get out of here." <laughs> If instead of flinching, you stuck your head out, punch, I'm glad to meet you. Come on in, son, let's have a drink. You know? <laughs> and she was ugly. <laughs> she wasn't very pretty. Uh, but you felt kind of comfortable. I, I did. Uh, you, you could say anything you want. It didn't matter. Um, but that's how I got introduced to Pancho. And, um, of course, my wife wanted to meet her. <laughs> she arranged it, and she met Gladys. She was a perfect lady. Uh, and Gladys later said, I don't believe all that horrible stuff they talk about her. And really, uh, in a way, you could do most anything you wanted to at Pancho's. But Pancho had limits of her own. And if you caused any kind of little trouble, she'd have her bouncer get 
three other places. <laughs> and once you were out, you never came back. <laughs> no, um, I was sorry to hear how she wound up dying in the place with nobody, no, uh, nobody knowing about it. I didn't know that. Yeah. At the Happy Body and Riding Club. But I thought the Air Force had uh, burned the place down or something like that. Yeah, but died she, she died in her home. As far as Chuck was concerned, particularly, she really liked him. Uh, and Ridley. She liked Ridley. And she kind of liked me, in a way. Uh, so you spent, you spent some time sitting at the bar and having a beer with her and all that? Uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did she smoke cigars all the time? Not with her panties on. <laughs> <laughs> Not with that first impression. <laughs> you you couldn't maneuver with it, Nick. You had that off angle shoot. Right. Subsonic gone. For flying wing forty eight. I had finished phase two. During phase. two, Two at the very beginning of phase two, I had the very first test you always do on an airplane, find out at, at what airspeed does it stall, lose lift. And nose goes down, you pick up. <laughs> In my case, the nose went down, but it didn't stop. It just oh God. tumbled. Tumbled in a negative tumble, so you were ass was off the seat and your arms were up here and I'm going to show you the cockpit of the 49. The throttles were hanging down from the ceiling so in my case with a negative tumble and my ass off the seat my hands here it was a godsend because number one I had never read anything about how you get out of a tumble. Um, I figured that if I, uh, the throttles were back uh, up here, if I applied full power as the nose was coming up, if I applied full power on one side, I could make it do kind of an awkward wing over. Uh, yeah, wing over. And that's what I did, and that's how I got out of it. Immediately. You had a lonely little major out here saying it tumbled. And you got the Northrop Corporation saying it did not tumble. They offered Max Stanley, who was the original test pilot for Northrop on the wing. He actually flew it first. They offered Max Stanley an ungodly large amount of money to do a call series, a stall series. And he politely told them what they could do with their money. No way. Now, back at right field, um, flight test engineer, I can't remember his name, told me, Bob, you will never get a clean stall with that wing because of the design. It will, you, you will always drop off to the right or to the left wing tip stall. And what you can do to get a full stall, I didn't ask the question, why do we want a full stall? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said, you can do it by trimming, see, because you're flying with uh, out of reach, with each wing tip out here is a clamshell that opens up this way for one purpose, or like that for another purpose. Uh, it's your combination aileron elevon. Um, he said, if you trim it in a positive sense, you're basically adding more lift to each wingtip. You will get a stall, a full stall. And I did, and it tumbled and all that. Uh, <clears throat> went through hell and high water. I was uh, <laughs> maligned and everything. But um, anyway... How many people were with you on the crew that day? Uh, 
Um, my co-pilot was Major Forbes, Daniel Forbes, Forbes Air Force Base, oh. Edwards Air Force Base. Right. Uh, it was almost Carinas, but... <laughs> um, I, I read that you trained Edwards. Oh, well, I didn't train him. Phase 3 was going to start, and Phase 3 was going to be a very highly technical stability and control. Well, it, it, let's go over this. Phase 1, Phase 2, Phase 3. So Phase 1 would be? Mac, uh, Mac Stanley, company pilot. I have to prove that it runs, it takes off, it lands. Period. Car. Yeah. Phase two, a little bit of performance, do some stalls and... Phase three, stability and control. How many engines? Four engines? Eight jet engines. Eight Originally eight. four, the XB-35, I made one flight. I have a copy, a little model there, propeller airplanes. Oh. Prop. Props. This is the XB-35. I made one flight, that was all. It was slow, it was clumsy. Um, so you're not a big fan of this flying wing, <laughs> uh, Of the 35, no. In fact, when I landed, I said, you know, if you put jets in it, I'll fly it again. Uh, that's the first wing that I flew. Well, the first wing I flew was a little blue and yellow one, the N9M. That's the one that they have out it. Yeah. They have it here somewhere. Yeah. Where is it? Out Plains of Fame or something. Uh, well, how many people flew that one? Was this that one? one? Yeah. Well, Max did. You know, their test. No, I mean the crew. Up the, the crew compliment. Oh, I don't know. On that one. Oh, when I flew it, it was pilot, co-pilot, and they had a test engineer running the engines. You know, when I talked to. Uh, but. Uh, it, anyway, it, we it, talked it, to jo Joe Engel. Remember Joe Engel name? Yeah. You know he flew. Uh, he flew the X-15. Then he flew the space shuttle. Yeah. <clears throat> and he said, the faster you go, the bigger the tail you need. <laughs> and I asked him. I said, why is the X-15? Why is the tail flat in the back? You know, if you ever think about it, it's like this. It's like that wide. It's flat. And he said, because at high speed, the water, the the air becomes as dense as water. And so it's just like at the tail end of a boat. And so you look at all the modern day fighters, and what do they have? They have two tails on them, big tails, you know. Yeah. And that's what the the flying wing didn't have, and this thing has nothing at all. Uh, yeah. And I mean, how do you how do you keep a coordinated turn when you don't have a tail? <laughs> Good thing you asked. Here's your two controls, here and here. They these are flaps in here. This is uh, aileron and elevon combined. Um, when you turn in this thing, <laughs> you have to le really lead because you're using, you don't have rudders. You know, you know, no rudders. There's no rudders at all? No rudders. Uh, you're using these out here. It, you have to get to really learn how how do you, you're actually almost cross control at certain points where you stop and turn. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, what happened? Are the, what are those are counter rotating. Oh, they're counter, okay. So yeah. they're three bladed counter rotating yeah, blocks, yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> it, it was a were they piston engines or jets? Piston? No, these were not jets. These were piston engines. So like a 4360 or? Something like that. A, a big one, yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a dog. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever used that in a report. This is a dog. Get jet engines and you improve it. And they did. Now, the jet had eight jet engines. Right. Four on each side. Right. And... Um, well, I don't want to interrupt, but I can show you that the cockpit is, is a nightmare. Well, so you never got to fly any of those, uh, those except for the P-38 then? Well, P-38, uh, the, the bombers was a, you, the, a 
I think it was a B-51 and then that 91 there, Martin. Right. Uh, well, that's a Martin, huh? Yeah. Well, let's let's go back to let's go back to the, the finish of the story of the YB forty nine. Okay. So so you flew that. Uh, I read where you actually showed the airplane off to Truman, uh, President Truman. Yeah. And was this before you? It flipped out, flipped on you, or no, after? No, no, no. The wind tumbled. Big controversy. Kept on testing. Um, the president wanted it back for his presidential air show, and I made the first nonstop flight in four hours and five minutes from uh, Muroc to, um, yeah, it was still Muroc. And um, when, when I landed there, that's That is your cockpit. Oh my God! Of the the pilots over on the left, your co-pilot is here. And if you remember the wing, it has it has a canopy over here on the this left side. Right. Uh, these are plexiglass here. The co-pilot. This is the plexiglass in the leading edge of the wing. He sits down here on the right side. The only thing he can see through is right dead ahead through the through the wing. I sit up here. This seat. I could touch the top of his head with my right foot. And these are the four throttles. Two on left, four engines, and I'm looking the bubble. See this black rim here? Right. That's where the bubble is attached to the surface of the wing. So you can see this seat was lowered for the picture. I'm looking up through the camera. Just a completely horrible setup for a future <laughs> transcontinental bomber. Um, and well, you couldn't see out with it darn, could you? Huh? You really couldn't see out hardly at all. Oh, I could, because I was up here in this bubble. Yeah, the bubble, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. What, what was a crew compliment supposed to be? <laughs> pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer. Now, the flight engineer was behind all of this, and he had a big panel um, that he kept control of, basically the engines. Anyway. I landed at Andrews. Truman came up in the cockpit and ladder and he looked around. He said, Major, it looks pretty good for good to me. I think we're gonna buy some. Ooh. I bit my tongue. I didn't know how much he knew or didn't know, so I better shut up. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, down on the ground he turned to the chief of the Air Force. And he said, General, why don't you have this young whippersnapper fly this thing down Pennsylvania rooftop level. I want people to see what I'm going to buy. I thought, the man is crazy. <laughs> I followed orders. I did that. And um, my boss, Boyd, said, Bob, watch those radio towers in this city. They're, they're pretty high. So I'm flying down. but." I did not know how many trees line Pennsylvania Avenue. So I'm trying to follow the avenue for the trees, but I would lose it for the trees. And then finally, I'm making one turn to look again, and I look up and the Capitol Dome was dead ahead. I had to pull up to go over the Capitol Dome. <laughs> uh, that one's... Uh, well, you weren't very much over the top of it, were you? What? You weren't very high over the top of it, that's for sure. Yeah. It looks like you're about 100 feet above the Capitol or something. Yeah. It wasn't much. But anyhow... How fast were you going? Huh? How fast were you going? Oh, well, I slowed down. Um, <coughs> I slowed down to 250 going down the avenue. And that's not very... 
a very long time in right, the defense yeah. So on now the other y, the other YB forty nine that that Captain Edwards was in when it crashed, did you you were on the investigation team for that, weren't you? Yeah. What happened? Five June. Um, the wing crashed. I had checked out Edwards. He inherited my co-pilot Major Forbes, and uh, he was do, going to do very detailed stability and control phase three. And uh, on 5 June, he crashed. So I told Gladys, I know what's going to happen. They recalled me out of school. Go back up and finish the goddamn test. So I'm back, I'm back now. And this is when I had to fly it to Washington. Mm and do some other further <clears throat> tests. And the stability and control tests finally gave the engineers all the information I think they needed to know that, well, bomb runs. On bomb runs, <laughs> um, you trimmed it, I trimmed that airplane up as fine as I could, but still, one degree, you're 5,000, 10,000, one degree this way, and the bombs go all over the place. You couldn't bomb with it, goddamn. Um, Were they envisioning using nuclear bombs at that time? No, not for the B-49. Really? No, no the <laughs> that was the other funny thing. They developed a nuclear bomb, but then <clears throat> they found out when they did drop a couple, that um, you, you have to be much higher because that's when they... Well, let's, let's, let's okay, so let's okay. finish with the YB-49. So, so, so anyway, you never had to give your impression of the darn thing except to write test results, which were probably not too promising. Um, <clears throat> well, the, the tumble being the main one, plus the fact couldn't bomb. Accuracy. So do you think the tumble was what actually uh, managed to uh, kill uh, Edwards and his crew? Or? No. <laughs> I checked him out at the end of phase two. He was going to do phase three. In their case, from the wreckage, I wasn't aboard. I wasn't around. But. Remember I told you in my case it was a negative tumble? And, well, uh, in his case, um, the way the wings broke off, in my case with a negative tumble, they were gone this way. We surmised that what he did, he was tumbling, but he had a positive tumble. He was glued down on the seat, and you saw the cockpit seat. He couldn't reach the throttles. Oh, wow. So they went in tumbling this way, this way, all the way. Then the wings came off finally. And from the way the wings fractured off, the engineers agreed with me that he had to have been in a positive tumble. Um, it just went, it's just like a leaf coming down. All 172 <clears throat> feet, yeah. And then, uh, but it, 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 did everything come down pretty close together? Then it all caught fire, right? Didn't it? It, was, what was that? it, it all caught fire, burned up. Well, it crashed. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole thing, except the two wing panels that flew off. Well, there, I, I was just reading something about people have gone out to the site, oh. and all they, and this, all these 50, 60 years later, and they said they could find pieces of, you know, melted aluminum and things like that. Well, so. yeah, well. It still had fuel. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, there had to be a big fire when it hit the ground. Yeah. Uh, and it happened on a Sunday, didn't it? I forgot. I, it seemed like it took him a few days to find it after it disappeared. No, 